Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arse Cast right here on arseblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Um, I've been struggling with the intro to this podcast and I realized this is going to sound strange perhaps to those of you listening, but part of the reason I couldn't get it done was because my headphones weren't loud enough. I was doing it, but I wasn't feeling it. I was slightly disconnected, disconcerted by it. I couldn't figure out what was wrong. And then I realized my headphones just weren't loud enough. I really, really need loud headphones when I'm doing this. Or when I'm listening to music or listening to things back, I need super loud headphones. Um, Always have. Don't quite know why. Just my personal preference. But there you go. And now look, it's flowing. The podcast has begun and we can get into it, even though on this week's show, I'm making a point of not getting into it where it equals what's going on at Arsenal at the moment. Because, let's face it, it has been kind of done to death. James and I had a massive long discussion about it on the Arsecast Extra on Monday. So if you haven't heard that and you want to get our opinion on the state of play at Arsenal, just go back and listen to that. But today, I just don't see the point in rehashing it. You know, I wrote about it on the blog for most of the week. We're in an interlull, so there's no game. There's nothing to, to focus on, really, or nothing Nothing is going to change this weekend that, that merits us having a, a discussion or a podcast about stuff we've already talked about. It's just, you know, we know the problems. Yes, there are problems. We know where they lie. We can all see the league table, et cetera, et cetera. So what is the point in trying to find a different way of saying the same thing. So we're not going to do that today. We are going to talk football, but not specifics about Arsenal and the team's form and uh, Unai Emery or any of those things, because i got nothing new to say about it. Nothing new. Which isn't to say that we're not going to talk about um, some football-related stuff, because we are now in a moment with our guest, but... I reckon we're just going to have a kind of long, rambly, interlull conversation about various things. We'll see where it takes us, but with the express idea of not delving into the minutiae of what's going on at Arsenal right now. So uh, if that sounds fair enough, stick with it. If you would prefer to hear long chats about Arsenal and formations and systems and points dropped and form and statistics and all that. This is not the place for you today. I'm sorry. We'll do it all again. Don't worry. Arsenal are going to serve us up some fresh meat that we can get our teeth into over the next week or two when, when we come back from this international break. Don't worry. There's loads more to come. But today, today, I just need to step back from it and hopefully, hopefully you'll still enjoy the show. Joining me for this interlull ramble is ryan hun ryan is the co-host of the stadio podcast along with musa okwanga who you will have heard on this podcast before usually when we uh, play manchester united ryan how are you i'm very well andrew thanks how are you good thank you um how is the how's the podcast going for you uh yeah really well thanks um we just posted uh what would be yesterday an interview with gary lineker as part of a kind of a series that we're doing. Mm. Um, so that was our first interview. Usually it's just Musa and I chatting every week uh, in Berlin about football yeah. and, you know, letting, letting Musa figure out which Marvel references he can work <laughs> into football chat each week, <laughs> basically. Okay. And how was, uh, how was Gary Lineker? He was really interesting. Yeah, it was mm. good. We chatted about, um, well, we're kind of doing this thing where we interview players when we can about their specific skill set. So uh, as we'll kind of mention there's one coming up with Ian Wright and with Gary Lineker and Ian Wright we mentioned we started to interview them about the art of finishing yeah but with um Gary it was really interesting because he started talking a lot about Bobby Robson um Barcelona about his time there how he went to sign there Mm. working with Johan Cruyff um players that he played with and he spoke a lot about Lionel Messi and stuff like that so it was great and for Arsenal fans there's zero Spurs chat so okay that's uh it means it's very palatable yeah 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 actually yeah I remember um you kind of forget Lineker was at Barcelona and did did really well there and um 
score goals and what have you, you know, um, in an era when many English players didn't really go abroad as well. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, the clip we posted from the Stadio Twitter account, which was from the podcast where he was talking about he scored a hat-trick in the Classico against Real Madrid mm. and then four against Spain in the Bernabeu within about a month of each other. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Mr. Popular in Madrid there. Yeah, well, I th- he said that, in, I won't, it's not too much of a spoiler, but the one of the Catalan sports papers the day after the England-Spain game said Catalan player scores four against Spain. <laughs> <laughs> they do take ownership, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's really highly regarded there though still. I think um, obviously there's a generational thing and we found the similar thing with Ian Wright that, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, I'm in my 30s and but there's a lot of my younger brother's generation, let's say, who don't even remember them being footballers at all or never saw them play. And I think that yeah. it's because they're so, um, you know, prolific in terms of TV work, I think that they maybe don't get as imp- appreciated by a certain generation just for how good they were, especially, I mean, righty. I think. Yeah. I mean, you know, I guess sort of nowadays where every goal is viewable from every angle in HD, you can stream it, you know, within seconds of a goal being scored, you can find mm-hmm. a clip of it on the internet. And I'm not saying former players missed out because of that. Obviously, it was a different era and what have you. But I do wonder what the what the reputation of certain players would be like nowadays if there was the same kind of media scrutiny on them, whether it would be improved or enhanced or whether they might suffer in the same way that some players suffer these days because, you know, you can you can be great for 10 games and have one banter moment and all that yeah. gets replayed is that banter moment and everyone, yeah. you know, has a laugh at that. A meme. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, all that hard work undone. Um, but actually, Gary Lineker said something really interesting. He said that the one thing that he... He he touched on the social media stuff, but he said the one thing that he's super envious of of players today, and it's not the money, it's the pitches. The pictures. He said they're the pitches. Sorry, the football pitches that they play on. So basically, the oh, playing the pitches. Surfaces. Right? Yeah. Of yeah. course. Yeah. Um, and just you know, with all the TV work they do, he just says some of the pitches they see. He's just like wow. Well, I, I mean, even if you go that. back, if if you even go back and watch stuff from the nineties, just watch stuff yeah. from the nineties on YouTube, and the pitches are. They're not great, particularly towards the end of the seasons. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I guess when you when you can look at the Emirates, for example, it's an absolute carpet. And that's true at pretty much every club now, regardless of mm. the stature of the club or the wealth of the club or anything else. The quality of the pitches is unbelievable. And not yeah. just at not yeah. just a Premier League level. Yeah, definitely. And actually, one thing that really surprised me, because Moose and I watched this unbelievable Ian Wright video that um, or DVD that I think it was part of an Arsenal membership pack that I'm not sure you you probably remember there was one year where they sent out a triple DVD of Arsenal legends one right. of them was Burkamp, one was Henri and one was Ian Wright and we basically watched the Ian Wright one because it had all of pretty much all of his Arsenal goals on mm. and actually how bad Arsenal uh, Highbury pit was yeah back in the early stages of Ian Wright's Arsenal career as well you you know Ars- Highbury obviously got such a reputation for being such an amazing pitch but actually even Ar- Highbury back then was just <laughs> completely it was a shit show compared to now yeah compare yeah and I I wonder often what the what the impact of that is on players and their quality and their technical quality because you know on the one hand if you're playing on great pitches you know you can do more with the ball probably but if you're having to deal with a bog and a you know a pitch that looks like um, no man's land from World War One, and you still need to control the ball. There's something to be said for being able to to do it. You know, I remember um, wondering for a long time. You know, when we heard about players coming from Spain and you players coming from Italy, for example, who who were always more technical. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I lived in Spain, I played football there in this. Uh, the Barcelona International Football League. And, you know, it wasn't really um, anything more than just lads kicking around on a, on a Saturday and, and what have you. It was great fun and what have you. But you would play at... We played in this ground north of Barcelona, in the north of the city, which was maybe a third division, or I can't remember, third, Catalan third division ground. I don't know. I had a big grandstand and, <laughs> and everything else. But it was just a hard clay pitch. 
Yeah. It was just hard packed dirt. So A, you learn very quickly to stay on your feet. There was no there was yeah. no such thing as um <laughs> there was no such thing as um sliding tackles apart from this one guy on our team who it didn't matter. <laughs> he would throw himself into a sliding tackle and, you know, come out from the game with his with his thighs and his hips in bits and skin falling off and everything. He didn't give a shit, but he was that kind of guy anyway. There's always one, right? There is always one. Always <laughs> one. Always and, one. And dare I, I don't want to, um, what's the word, uh, stereotype here, but <laughs> physically, if I was to say that this guy was maybe about 5'8 and just a little bit on the heavy side, it's yeah. usually that guy. It's usually, usually wearing copper good. mundials, <laughs> like good boots, good uh, boots, you know. Well, but. yeah, you couldn't wear you couldn't wear studs on these pitches either. So, <laughs> um, but but it it really made you you know from playing all my life on grass, it really mm. makes you play the game in a different way because you've got to stay in your feet. The ball bounces completely differently. Um, trying to control it and what have you is, is you know it's it's just different. So you have to be technically better. Um, because of these pitches. And I wonder if that is, uh, you know, is a part of why perhaps, you know, I think that the gap when English clubs used to play um, foreign clubs and and you could see maybe a real gap in the technical level of the players compared to some of the English players. Um, Mm. Obviously, there aren't that many English players playing in the Premier League um, anymore. Um, But that's, yeah, that'll be an interesting one. Gary Lineker and then obviously Ian Wright. We're going to come back to the Ian Wright thing in a while. Um, In terms of the podcast itself, how are you enjoying the the medium and putting it all together and doing all the behind the scenes work of like emailing Uh, people and going, please, can, will you talk to me? Will you talk to me today? Well, I mean, because Moose and I were on another one last season and this season we've kind of gone on our own. So I think the difference this year is that we haven't actually had any guests on you know like on the phone or whatever like we did on the last one yeah it's very much just been him and i which i'm not gonna lie is technically a lot easier of course across the table from each other (laughs) um but actually i quite enjoyed that dynamic because it because it is just our thing now Mm. um we can go off in tangents if we want to you know um Musa went down the whole thing about when the Arsene Wenger was linked to the Bayern job about leaving him alone and how he was, you know, Andy Dufresne on the beach at the end of Shawshank without even realising that David Squires had already done it. That was amazing, um, yeah. We had a little difference between, instead of, I think David Squires had Gunnosaurus as basically the co-star, whereas we imagined yeah. Vic Akers would be walking at the beach <laughs> in shorts, even if it was about minus 15. <laughs> um but, you know, basically we can just go anywhere and we don't set ourselves time restraints because I edit. So I produce and edit and yeah. publish and do all the... Musa basically rocks up, chats for a bit and then bounces. And, um, and um, I kind of chop away because my background is a little bit more music-based and audio-based and yeah. stuff. So um, so we just like to talk, basically. And, and then we, you know, leave the kind of work to the edit because I think that if we set ourselves time restraints, I think you can sometimes, you know, sometimes we find, I don't know if you and James find this, but um, maybe it might be the third or fourth time that one of us has repeated a point that we actually go on in a direction that is this super interesting direction and that rolls to something else. And and I think for us, I think so much of, I mean, stepping into a marketplace as saturated as a football podcast <laughs> is, you know, not a very clever idea really. But I think that, so much of it, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you find this as well, but so much of it I find just can be quite inaccessible for people just in terms of the way that it's presented. I think that with Musa being, you know, a bisexual black male writing about football, that gives him a very different kind of stance on a lot of football coverage and me being a very new um, person in the industry, if yeah. you like. Uh, we really want it to be ex- as accessible for, you know, my dad and his mates who you know work who still go in, what's a, in london what's a podcast what's a podcast exactly yeah. exactly uh, or you know a, a a muslim woman from the states who really likes football mm. you know um and i think we do that i think we've got you know we we don't do it for the sake of doing it we just genuinely enjoy talking about it so we cover a lot of women's football as well and moose is a bit of a a wolfsburg frauen he thinks he's an ultra but he's not really an ultra <laughs> um <laughs> um 
you know, so we cover a lot of the Frauen Bundesliga and the Women's Super League and yeah. stuff like that. So, and Musa actually interviewed the German captain, Alexandra Pop, recently. So, you know, cool. it's, 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 kind of stuff that we like we just like talking about football yeah that's it I mean look football podcasts the only genre which has more podcasts I think is comedians interviewing other comedians Um, apart from that it's just it's just football what else do you listen to in uh, in podcast world is um, is there anything that's sort of regular let's say outside of football that's on your rotation I mean I actually listen to a lot of NBA podcasts because I'm a big NBA fan oh who's your team uh, I'm, I'm an Indiana Pacers fan, so being an Indiana Pacers fan and an Arsenal fan, it kind of I have no frame set me up for much glory. <laughs> I have no frame of reference for for that at all. Well, I imagine if um, if if you know, I don't know. They put it this way: they're not they're not great. They're not okay. terrible, but they're not great. You know, right. and and it's a very random kind of reason why it's not like I have any ties to a player or whatever. But apart from that, um, I mean, I really enjoy. Um, I tell you what I really enjoyed actually it was kind of something I also watched on TV this year which was the Chernobyl podcast so yeah. the Chernobyl show yeah um, I think it was is it Craig Mazin who did the show um, he also did a podcast that accompanied each episode and I mean for me it was I actually think it was probably the best thing I saw on TV this year anyway but with the added thing of a podcast I just found it super interesting because he went through a lot of um like as someone who's quite creative i suppose i found it really interesting to hearing him talk about his creative processes on the show because you're dealing with something that is a massive historical event yeah but also you have to make some artistic choices that feed the narrative easier for the viewer so yeah and it was just super he was just really transparent with it all and i found that really interesting like even in episode one you know he dealt with the um, the question why everyone was just speaking in their normal accent yeah and and things like he said that when people were auditioning he found that people were would start to audition the accent and not the role so they just decided straight away to just let people speak how they would speak and because it was focused at western audiences yeah we're essentially hearing it how they would have been hearing it at the time because we're hearing it in our mother tongue yeah it was such a good series actually i did listen to the podcast as well it was fantastic um yeah it was really good yeah like, um i didn't realize the series was directed by a guy called johan rank who hmm. people may or may not know um directed the videos uh, bowie's black star video that, yeah. that was uh, released just before he died yeah um, he was a music i think he had a background in music videos yeah i think that was his proper proper background yeah right so yeah, yeah. that was I know cool. you're, yeah, you're a big Bowie fan, aren't you? So. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, do you know what else, I, I, what happened? You know, with podcasts as well, you get like a, a lot of focus goes on these like true crime yeah. podcasts, right? Yeah. Like Serial and I can't remember, there's, there's loads of them. And they're always profoundly disappointing to me or vaguely offensive because A, they dredge up an old case and don't, don't do anything but like make it all current again, but without finding any resolution for it. Like, did hmm. this guy kill that girl? Well, here's 10 episodes in which we'll se- uh, sell you, you know, um, MailChimp and mattresses. <laughs> and then at the end of it, you've got no idea whether or not the guy killed a girl or not, but he probably did. You know, I find those the most frustrating podcasts. Um, yeah. You know, there's a load of investigation and, you know, there's always... There's always that sound effect, isn't there, where they're driving up and you can hear them opening the car door, closing the car door, walking up to a door and all that kind of stuff. But I I did find one. Someone recommended it to me on Twitter and I apologize because I can't remember who it was, but it's actually um, a mystery, true crime mystery podcast where in the end they, they find out who did it and you know you, you get resolution right all of it is solved for mm. you right at the end of the podcast Amazing. and it's um it, it's really really interesting and it's probably the only one i've heard of it's called bear brook um where they find these bodies in a barrel oh, um, i've heard of this yeah it's really good and it's produced by new hampshire public radio <laughs> and and it was one of those where i was listening to it going Someone had said, look, you should listen to this because they get there in the end and you're sort of listening to it going, this is maybe a bit samey, but like it takes a great turn and and you find out in the end 
um, what happened. And that's very satisfying because every other fucking one of those podcasts I've listened to, you're at the end going, ah, you fuckers. You just made me listen to 10 episodes and you don't know what's happened. And I don't know either. Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah, I just, I I don't, I mean, I don't enjoy getting that emotionally invested in something and then just to be kind of almost tossed out on the street again. Yeah. Just be like, there you go. You're on your own again. Yeah. We don't know what's happened. You don't know what's happened. There were a couple that were like that that I listened to this year, but there was, there were resolutions in both. So they they were from the Australian, the newspaper. Oh, right. There was one called The Teacher's Pet. Oh, yeah. Which was good. And that there was, was another good, one they yeah. did called Who the Hell is Hamish, which was good as well. Right. Some dude who was just a massive con artist. Okay. Um, I mean, neither of them are comedies, put it that way. But No, um, the but teacher's pet one certainly isn't. Um, no, it's quite quite dark. Did they, um, I mean, is, I don't know if that's still available because I think there was stuff going on with that case where they might have had to like pull the podcast down or make yeah, it unavailable. Yeah, I think they did actually. Yeah. yeah. I think they did because they were going to trial and they were a little bit worried about how yeah, stuff my, would... My pre- Prejudice kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, I must check out the Who the um, Hell is Hamish one as yeah. well. So, I mean, I still listen to uh, as much as I can, but they're always quite long, so I tend to save them for long journeys. But the Mark Maron one, yeah, that's good when he gets good people on. Um, it is. I'm, I'm curious about that show and how it's how it's kind of developed, you know, because uh, mm. I'm a big, big fan as well. And I, I've interviewed him in the past. I did a podcast. Yeah, with him I listened before. to that actually. I thought, I thought, I, I want to say, man, I thought that was really good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> he strikes me as the kind of guy who just you know, sorry, Mark, if you're listening, but, you know, can't really be asked with that kind of stuff a lot of the time. Um, yeah, I, I was a little bit afraid that might be the case, you know, putting yeah. him on the other side of the mic, but he was great. Once he got talking, yeah. he was great. And, like, just put him in a studio behind a uh, an SM7B and he's happy enough to to chat away. But I think what was really interesting about that show, you know, when it first started breaking through was the fact that, no, A, nobody really knew what a podcast was and they didn't mm. really understand the format of the interview because all these people are 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 used to being interviewed like actors and comedians and uh, singers and all that kind of stuff for these kind of junkets so they go in mm. and you've got an album to promote or you've got a film to promote or a tv show to promote and you do like two days of interviews and you you sit there in front of 20 people doing these 10 minute interviews where you're saying the same stuff you know how did the character you know uh, appeal to you what do you see of your you know all this kind of bullshit but when you're sitting there for an hour or maybe more with somebody and you're just having a conversation all this stuff sort of naturally came out you know and he had these amazing yeah. episodes with people but i just wonder what it's like now for him given the profile of you know his profile is obviously very high now mm-hmm. and the profile of the show and everybody understands what the show is about like is it more difficult for him to have these kind of authentic conversations with people that that he did in the past yeah i find that interesting as well because obviously it's not something that you can really tweak the formula of yeah um he he you know he can't all of a sudden start bringing in you know like a bonus round or something like that it's just very (laughs) much like yeah kind of his it's so solely reliant on him and i think that therefore it makes it very um dependent on the guest yeah um, I tend to find the ones, my favourite ones are those of people that he's had beef with in the past. And he invites on, he's like, oh, do you not remember that thing that we had in like the 90s? And he's like, yeah, 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 you yeah, know, yeah. I, was, I was like, you know, I was pretty high at the time. We, yeah. you know, it's always all his beef comes from, <laughs> from that kind of period of his life. But when they kind of, where they either solve it on air or if the guest kind of says like, no, you were, you were like a, a proper prick. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. Or something like that. I really enjoy those ones because... You don't really get that a lot, you know, or if people have that kind of dynamic, usually you'd probably edit it. You know, actually, yeah. Musa is really mean to me every week and I just have to edit it out all That's the time. That's it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, those, <laughs> who, those who know Musa, you know. <laughs> I think I think he's probably run out of those people now, actually, because he's, he's beefed with, with so many. Um, yeah, I thought, I thought it's like that, a real life, uh, sorry, it was like yeah. a real life, my name is Earl, almost, you know, <laughs> kind of going around and making up for all his, all his kind of, past beefs by yeah, just yeah, yeah. putting people on his podcast uh, the one with um, Ed Norton recently was really good if if people are looking yeah. for, for one to listen to um, and, yeah, and you don't good. listen to that um, that's a good one do you like um, do you like as uh, somebody who has a background in, in audio and music do you like Song Exploder I haven't checked many a lot of people keep referring me to them I think I checked one because is that when they go through a specific song yeah 
And it's quite short. It's quite a short podcast. They're usually about episode. 20 minutes, 15, 20, maybe 25 minutes max, but, you know, 20 minutes and the, the artists will sit there and they'll take apart the song and talk yeah. about where it came from, whether it's a sample or a guitar chord or whatever it might be. And you get little snippets of it or you get an acapella of the vocal or, or what have you. And some of them, like, you know, the music is not to my taste, but sometimes you discover mm-hmm. something... Um, you discover something which is worth listening to. Um, you know, the way they break the songs down is 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 really interesting, you know, from a technical mm-hmm. point of view. And then you get to hear the song at the end. So, Okay, cool. Yeah, go. Um, yeah, so it's something we do with Stadio. We play out on a different piece of music. And obviously, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but we figured that, you know, not a lot of people hang around for the outro mm. music of a, of a podcast. So we thought, A, it kind of gives the podcast a little something extra or something different to other football podcasts and you know maybe some people might find stuff they haven't heard before or yeah you know and explore artists that they might not have heard before and stuff like that and who gets to know, choose is it week by week uh, One each? I, I get to choose <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> musa doesn't want that problem all oh, right so uh. he's just he's just he just defers to me i mean we check i i suggest each week and i check check with him but all right he's pretty yeah he's pretty open to that. if anyone's wondering why you sound a little bit different we've had some connection issues this is why when you're sitting in the same room as somebody face to face you don't have these problems when you're producing a podcast whereas when you know you're in berlin i'm in dublin and somehow internet gremlins have got us in the way so you're in a different room which is a little bit echoier which is why all of a sudden in the middle of that conversation you sound um <laughs> you sound a bit different but hey that's podcasting for you that's the beauty of it it's it's Sorry, not all everyone. it's not all slick and polished it's a little bit grimy a little bit grubby at times it's got it's like vinyl it's like the vinyl crackle of um of the audio world i'm just bring, bringing a very amateur flavor to your very professional setup andrew that's well, what i'm doing that's fine i was being diplomatic here but now that you've admitted to it uh, I'll, I'll lay the blame firmly at your door. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about, you know, some sort of Arsenal stuff, but not necessarily mm. the Arsenal stuff that's been done to death. And an interesting one this week is is Arsene Wenger returning to the football world, not as a manager again, but as chief, uh, chiefers, FIFA's chief of global football development uh, yeah. it had been sort of on the cards a bit um were you surprised at all that he didn't didn't give it one last bash in the dugout or um i think if you'd asked me this same question a year ago i would have said extremely surprised but i think i get the impression that even he surprised himself at how much he was enjoying the time off if i'm being honest mm. he seemed to um he seemed to i mean he looks <laughs> amazing considering yeah I mean, I mean he's always been in amazing shape but i think that you see the you know p- pictures and footage of his you know the last season at arsenal and he just looks so exhausted unwell so doesn't tired. it yeah. Yeah. yeah and you can really see that all of those years and especially because of how toxic it got at arsenal and you he strikes me as the kind of guy who took it really personally um because I imagine there's so much stuff that people didn't know about or still don't know about that he kind of fronted up for. So I think something like the Bayern job, I think would have really appealed to him because it was de- it would have definitely been a temporary measure until the end of the season. And I think as soon as the Bayern hierarchy made it clear that they weren't interested, which I actually think is kind of a mistake. I think he would have been a really good f- fit there for mm. a, as a temporary, as an interim coach. Um, yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense for him, actually. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about him being that close to Infantino yeah. so often. Um, I do, you know, a little bit worried about him. Kind of, I don't know. I think he's a smart guy, but I think that, and hopefully he can compartmentalize stuff like that. But I, I hope it, I hope it that he brings more positivity and more good work to that organization than the opposite if that makes sense yeah it does have its issues that's for sure um tr- you know yeah, treading I mean, carefully I think, I think, yeah definitely yeah <laughs> i think for fifa it's i mean it's a from a from a pub like from a pr point of view it's an amazing uh an, an amazing appointment because 
they've been so often criticised as, as an organisation that has no real idea or care or love about football, really. Yeah. And they've hired one of the, probably the biggest recent working football romantics with Arsene Wenger. And someone who's, a, you know, I mean, Moose and I talk about him quite a lot, actually, because even though Moose is a Manchester United fan, he has a real admiration for Wenger. And things, little things that may seem really small to people, but, you know, when David Bowie died and hearing him talk about him in the press conference, yeah. it's not something you really get a lot of managers doing. And he seems to be just someone who's a lot more in tune with humanity in football are because it is such a bubble um so i mean from P fifa's point of view an amazing appointment um i hope that the hours are kind and that he maybe has flexi time or something like that so he doesn't have to put in too much work <laughs> i guess there'll be but, a lot of traveling because he's a development chief development officer for you know the world game and obviously he's going to be in, in in uh in charge i think they said he's going to be an authority when it comes to ifab which is the organization that makes the rules of football and mm. i think that's in in focus this week and throughout this season, hasn't it? Uh, it's been with VAR or VAR. I don't know which one to do. I think VAR just suits me much better um, because it's been a fucking clusterfuck in the in the Premier League. And and Wenger is somebody who who was advocating for uh, technology in football for a long time and. He was of the opinion that it didn't necessarily have to slow down the game. It wouldn't have an impact on the spectacle or the entertainment. And I think what we're seeing with, with VAR this season is, A, it, it's just so, it, it seems so arbitrary in terms of the decisions that it makes, the length of time it takes to make decisions, the inconsistency that some decisions, um, you, you look hey. at it and you say, yeah, VAR got it right. But other times you look at it and you go, how, how did they not? Uh, make an adjudication on that like the one I can think of immediately was Genduzi against Leicester and to me that was 100% yeah. a penalty like if that had been at the other end and we hadn't been given a penalty by VAR I'd have been going crazy over that um, so the way it's been implemented in the Premier League is a bit of a problem isn't it I mean yes in short <laughs> I mean it's been uh... I think kind of embarrassing considering how long they've had to implement it mm. as opposed to other competitions or leagues. I mean, we, you know, we live in Germany and they, the Bundesliga has had it for a little while now. I wouldn't say it's a popular um, process or method of refereeing in, in Germany. There are multiple fan protests about it and it's not a popular thing at all. But I think the way that it's implemented in the Bundesliga is a lot more smoother than it is in the Premier League and I know there's probably a little joke about German efficiency there but <laughs> I think that part of the uh, part of the reason that it is or it has maybe as a viewer been implemented more smoothly is because you see what you can see the process so you can see for example uh, when I was actually at a Dortmund game in Hertha at the Olympic Stadion in Berlin in March or April and out of nowhere there was a VAR call but you know it's a VAR call because the referee's blown, he signalled, and he goes over to the monitor to view what happened. And then he gives a penalty. So you instantly know what's going on, as, whereas in the Premier League, it just seems to be the ref stops, blows the whistle, points to his ear, and everyone's just standing around him. And no, one's no, no one knows what's going on. There's no, yeah. uh, there's no signal that there is something being checked or something's, that something communicated to the fans that something's going on. And I think this is why... <laughs> the thing about the monitor infuriates people because it's right there. Yeah, exactly. And it's <laughs> it's almost as if, you know, pe people, one of the, the, the criticisms people had was that it would take authority away from the referee and they insisted, no, it won't take, it won't do that. But that's, that's exactly what they're doing in a way because you think about the one with Socrates in yeah. whatever game that was, was that um, Palace? And was it, it Palace? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah it, was Palace, it was the yeah. Palace game, and he scored a goal that should have given Arsenal three points. And all of a sudden, after celebrating, there's this check, and the referee Martin Atkinson is standing there. And then you you find out afterwards that the decision on that goal was made by an official who has never refereed a Premier League game in his life. So while Martin Atkinson is standing there on the pitch, just sort of waiting, 
in in that time he could have run over he could have walked over he could have actually fucking got down on on his back and pushed himself along like a weirdo and still had time to go over look at the monitor and look at the incident and i think martin atkinson whatever you might think of him as a referee would not have disallowed that goal but instead they've taken that authority away from that referee on the pitch um and he looks like a twat because it's a shit decision when he could easily just go over to the tv it's just there yo well, this is i mean it's almost like um spent i mean this is kind of i think it's such a, a almost like a metaphor of what the of premier league excess in a way you know i mean those monitors can't be cheap the system isn't cheap but it's almost like buying a 2000 3000 pound 2000 3000 euro tv and just never turning it on mm. just having it there yeah you know it's like what is the point if you're why come up with this you know purple premier league branded var monitor and just have it sat there and you know i'm i'm not one for i'm not a massive one for hashtag football banter but peter crouch did really make me laugh when he commented on it on match of the day about how it reminded him of his year at burnley you know it was just like underused or something like that <laughs> and um, i actually think he's quite funny peter crouch but uh, on tv but i thought that's it it's just it's it's absurd and i think it only the premier league and maybe this is me being a little bit extra mean but i think only the premier league can delay its implementation for a while to make sure that they get it absolutely right and fuck it up this monumentally. It's just absolutely wild. Um, and I think also the another problem is just the, the shifting in um, not directives or initiatives when they come out and they say VAR is going to check for this more, this they're going to be looser on this next mm. week. It reminds me a little bit of a few years ago where there was that m- big uh, referee briefing before the season about professional fouls away from goal you know like tactical fouling oh yeah yeah and and another one i think it was the same season where they were talking about grappling in the box and granite jacker got sent off on the halfway line by john moss (laughs) yeah (laughs) and then two weeks later it was just not a thing anymore and i thought well where i think this is where people just get really exasperated with the whole thing is that they just want consistency i don't think they want any more and and i personally when var was it uh came into the men's world cup in russia i actually thought it was used pretty well yeah me too I, yeah i think it added something a little bit ref, uh, a little bit new and it was quite fresh and the way that it was used was quite smooth and it added a little bit of extra drama. And But I think that when you've seen it rolled out at club level, it's not had that same same level of efficiency, I don't think. I mean, even though I said the Bundesliga has used it to a more efficient level than the Premier mm. League, there, has been some, there have been some catastrophic kind of uses of it. There was one where a game went to half time and then it came back out again because of a penalty decision. And so it's not exactly <laughs> super, super smooth. But sure. It, compared to the Premier League... Mm. I mean, it's not hard. The bar is low. <laughs> no, that's true. I mean, I think the best part about VAR this season has been how much it's irritated Pep Guardiola. For me, that's <laughs> the only saving grace of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just, uh, as you see with a lot of other things with football developments, it's just developments within the game have led to rule changes or mm. rule tweaks. And basically, you're using 21st century technology for you know 19th century rules a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. So, it just needs to up, it just needs to update the rules and you can't you know the off, like the offside rule wasn't supposed to be measured by that closer distance that's not what it was there for so maybe it's not necessarily var per se it's maybe that it just doesn't sync that well with the rules that it's being yeah, used yeah i do want, yeah i do wonder if you know cuz clearly the handball thing is an issue as well and offside is now it's just ridiculous even if yeah. supposedly var can give you like a black and white thing like is any part of that attacker's body ahead of the defender, then it's offside. It's supposed to give you clarity, but, you know, it it depends where you draw the lines. And I mean, literally draw the lines on the screen. Like, you know, one line has him offside. Another line doesn't. You know, when exactly is the ball kicked? Is it when the guy makes contact with the ball or is it when the ball leaves his foot? You know, uh, it may be a case that VAR VAR actually... um, 
sparks a kind of uh, long, hard look at the rules of football and, and maybe um, we see some changes over the coming years that will be because of, of VAR. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you start when you start getting football fans talking about frame rates, it's a bit like, <laughs> what are we doing? You know? Yeah. So, is this what we all signed up for? No, I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure that it is. Let's talk a, a bit about something Arsenal related and just to, you know, just to clarify, this is not um, anything to do with the current head coach or anything like that. But one of the things mm. that people, one of the things people, I guess, I'm not going to say fantasize about, but it, it's kind of this romantic idea, isn't it, of a former player coming back to a club and managing it and being successful and, and all that kind of stuff. And I was just sort of thinking about some of the, the potential candidates to do that from an Arsenal point of view in wake of the news that Thierry Henry is now the new coach or will be the new head coach of Montreal Impact in, in MLS. Which is, That's a, an interesting it. move, isn't it? Yeah, I'm actually quite impressed by that move from Thierry, if I'm being honest. Because I think a lot of ex-players of his stature, having failed at a club like Monaco where he was at, you know, that was a, an example of an ex-player going back to a, yeah. a club they played at and having not succeeded or kind of failed in the way he had. I think a lot of players wouldn't have bothered giving it another go or maybe would have felt a little bit too high profile to go to a club like Montreal Impact. Mm. So I kind of respect it from him in in a way. I think it's... It's kind of very similar to what Patrick Vieira did. I think it's it's a good move from players like that to go and maybe hone their skills as managers a little bit off the radar. And that's no disrespect to the MLS or whatever, but it doesn't have the same level of scrutiny or coverage or pressure that a lot of clubs in Europe have. Yeah. Um, especially when you are a player. I mean, he is a, an MLS legend as well. So that will undoubtedly buy him some kudos or time if he needs it yeah um and i think maybe players will listen a little bit more than in certain situations in in europe um Did so you... actually i think it's really i think it's a really good move it could be a really good move for him mm. and um you know it's definitely not a um an upwards move it's mm. definitely a sideways or well i mean it's move, it's an but, upwards move uh, in the sense that he has a job now and the one in monaco <laughs> yeah. was you know went went disastrously did you listen to the jamie carraher podcast um no i with haven't yeah. it, it's good actually because he does sort of ask him some questions that he hasn't really been asked before or sort of frames them in a way that you haven't really heard Henri talk about them before and uh, you know he spoke quite a lot about when he was a kid like uh, you know how demanding his dad was mm. on him, and he, he tells a story about how he went to he went to a game, um, played a game. The father used to drive like him and a few of the players there. This is when he was a teenager, and you know they won six nil, and he scored all six goals, and he's feeling really good about himself. And then he realized that there was something wrong because the, the, the his dad was supposed to give a lift home to a few of the other guys and he told them to go get the bus, basically. So they're sitting in the car and they pull up to the first set of traffic lights and there's, his dad's not talking to him. And he's going, what? What's going on? I scored six goals. We won six nil. I played really well. And then they get to the next set of traffic lights and his dad just starts. He's going, in the 13th minute, you did this. In the 17th minute, you did oh, that. Wow. You did blah, 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 blah. And I do wonder if that, like, you know, obviously it was something he used to drive himself as a player and to be demanding of himself as a player. But I wonder, like, what is he going to be like as as a coach? Because one of the things I guess you saw maybe with, with Roy Keane was that he was such an amazing player. He really had no concept of um, players below his level. Or yeah. players who weren't willing to to sort of be as committed as he was, he found it. I guess he found it really difficult to to deal with them. Even though you know his managerial career has 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 seen him work with those players more often than any others. Yeah, I always think that's something that I can imagine happening with Thierry is that, and it's actually something Gary Lineker not wanting to plug, but Gary Lineker kind of mentioned when Cruyff took over at Barcelona, and he's mm. saying you know he was still the best player in training, and I do wonder if 
when you have a player, an ex player who is that good still, and you know, Thierry's in good shape as well. It must be extremely difficult when you're trying to coach players who, with all due respect, that kind of massive football cliche, mm. but who aren't at their level. And even though they're not playing anymore. So I think the psychology of being an absolute elite goal scorer like Thierry Omri was maybe doesn't translate that well to being an elite level manager because mm. you when you are an elite goal scorer the only thing you really need to focus on is yourself really I mean you you, you know obviously the better ones do bring other people in yeah. as we know but it's all about the goals and it's all about you getting them whereas managing a group of complex individuals from different cultures and different backgrounds at different stages of their career at different abilities you've got to show a hell of a lot of emotional intelligence and empathy yeah and as much as i love thierry Henry, i'm not <laughs> entirely sure he's the most empathetic person out there um so yeah i mean it's it's a completely different skill set as you know people have said a million times great ma- players don't necessarily make great managers and when they do they're very rare yeah um So I'm really interested to see how that goes. I think it's uh, interesting in the timing that obviously the MLS season is just fully finished um, with the MLS Cup last week. So he has a full pre-season there. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of loan signings from certain European clubs. Yeah. Um, I think that could be quite interesting because of the the way the seasons overlap as well. So, yeah, I mean... I mean, good luck to him, really. I hope he does well there, and I hope it leads to a similar trajectory to what we've seen with Patrick Vieira, who obviously isn't at a, you know, a kind of um, a Champions League club per se, or, you know, a top, a blue chip club, if you like, but he's definitely progressing. He's, he's doing his, um, he's doing his time, isn't he? Yeah, definitely. You know, I rather than... think that's quite encouraging from, you know, players who don't walk straight into the first big job that they're offered because of their name. Mm. Um, I think it maybe uh, suggests a little bit more awareness of them actually learning their craft. As yeah. It were. I was thinking about, you know, who, who, who was out there and who, who were potentially former Arsenal players who, who could be considered for the Arsenal job. Obviously Vieira is, is one of them, but at the moment, uh, Nice are in, uh, 13th in league. Uh, yeah. um, not having a particularly great season. So, no. you know, it could be all part of his learning curve. And, I, you know, it's difficult sometimes when you don't know a club and you don't know the, the culture of a club or what's going on there to properly judge a manager's performance, you know, because um, you you look at that and you think, well, that's not great. Is that the kind of Is that the kind of form or is that the kind of performance level that suggests he could manage a club like Arsenal? But, you know, who knows what's going on in terms of transfer budgets or internal politics and all those things which, which affect a, a manager's performance. Um, Silvino was manager of Leon. He got sacked last month. Yeah, he didn't have a great time. No, he didn't. No, they're not doing well this season. No, uh, they are, where are they? They're in 14th, so they're just below uh, Nice. So I'm not sure that he's really an option. Uh, Giovanni Van Bronckhorst um, is a bit of a dark horse because he's, he's had, you know, sort of not under the radar um, experience because he was manager of Feyenoord, um, mm. which is a, a really big club. But I read, now it's only on Wikipedia, of course, so you've got to um, question the, the veracity of it. But he, he has been linked with the Abu Dhabi group and might be being groomed for one of the jobs at the, the City group. So okay. who knows? Um, the other one is Saul Campbell, of course. Um, mm. Active managers I'm thinking of. I, can't, I couldn't think of any more than that. Uh, Saul is having a very difficult time with South End United. They're um, second from bottom of League One, and the bottom team are Bolton, who have minus two points yeah. <laughs> because yeah. of their um, their their issues with administration and what have you. They, they were docked 12 points. So they're on minus two points, South End on five points, and it doesn't look particularly good for him there. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's really, like you say, it's really thin on the ground in terms of, ex-Arsenal players out there in positions that you would see could lead to a path to the Arsenal job. I think that's probably why there was always so much noise around Mikel Arteta. Yeah. Because he was the only one 
you know, but I think it was a two a few years too early for someone like Freddie. Um and obviously, you know, being under or being part of Pep Guardiola's staff is always gonna push you up the list a little bit, I think. Um but I'm I've never been fully sold on the idea of Arteta as an Arsenal manager, if I'm being honest, because I think that as much as it would be amazing for someone like that to come in and be an unbelievable manager, it's just such an unknown. And I think that Arsenal are, as a club at the moment can't really afford an unknown. Yeah, anymore. I mean, but we got a known. And I don't want to go down this road because we sort of said we wouldn't do this on the podcast, <laughs> but we did get a known and it, it sort of hasn't worked out. <laughs> yeah, you know, but it, yeah, look, I think Arteta is is an option. Um, I think he has to be an option. He was really, 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 really close to the job. Mm-hmm. And then um, from talking to a few people this week, it seems that, that Raul Senyehi was the guy who strongly advocated for, for Unai Emery to get the job ahead of ahead of Arteta and Gizidis obviously made the decision but uh, I think he's what an interesting all, all Don's man in mafia movies their um, empire starts coming down yeah like Don Rowles is already crumbling yeah exactly it didn't last yeah. very it didn't last very long but the <laughs> yeah. thing about that isn't it is that usually somebody else some young up and comer comes along and you know <laughs> shoots them with a gun that they've got hidden in a bathroom <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know who that is whoever that is out there listening to it don't do it don't do no. it murder's not good <laughs> Um, I, I, I suspect he might be an option though, if and when the time comes, but that's, yeah, definitely. that's a conversation yeah. for another day. Let's, I, mean, I mean, just to clarify, I'd love, I would love him to be a really good option. Yeah. And if he did come in, do a really good job. It, it's just, I mean, I've always from speaking from a purely personal point of view, I've always, um, when he was available, I was really hoping we'd get someone like Thomas Tuchel. Mm. Because I think that his kind of profile of manager um, and just him as a guy, I just, I find him really impressive. And I think with the kind of players that we have on, at the squad, in the squad at the moment, I think he would be someone who was, he would be ideal. And I, I do, I mean, you, you're obviously have a lot more, you have a lot more connections with the club than I do, but I do wonder if there was contact there before us and decided to go because it seemed like the Arsenal moved a little bit too late or, mm. you know, um, and I think he probably, from what I've read from people who who are kind of, you know, hashtag in the know, it seems to be that it was something he was open to. Hadn't hadn't um, he already agreed with PSG Yeah, around, yeah. around the time that Arsene said he was stepping down? Yeah, but apparently so I read somewhere and I'm not sure. I think it was, I could, I'm usually pretty skeptical when i read stuff from various sources but there was one who seemed to be pretty uh, uh, pretty reliable who said that i think gazidis had made contact at some point earlier on in the season right um but it, again he went to psg and it was too late this is all me kind of speculating but he he would be someone who i'd love to see as next arsenal coach now the problem is i think he's just signed a contract extension pretty recently till 2021 yeah um so it, we, you know, it might be not the next guy. I mean, look, you, you're you're in Germany, and you obviously see a lot of Bundesliga. And one of the things that that um, I don't know if it's a trend, but but it strikes me that there is a tendency for German clubs to be a bit more, a bit braver when it comes to mm. making appointments of new managers than the Premier League. And you, you can understand why. Like Premier League club is a a massive operation, and you know there's a there's a lot at stake. And perhaps less than there would be for a for a Bundesliga club, uh, particularly one that might not be considered one of the one of the big boys. But but you know someone like Nagelsmann, who was very young when he got mm. his job, and um, I'm not saying Arteta is that guy or or whatever, but I, I do wonder if it's something that clubs are going to have to look for um, and be a bit more smart about rather than just sort of going through the roster of right who's available who's done a few years you know at at a mid mid-sized european club who can just sort of keep us chugging along the way we're chugging along like maybe if you want to maybe if you want to do something special um you're going to have to be brave you're going to have to take a risk you're going to have to do something like i know he wasn't experienced but but people forget what it was like for Arsenal to appoint 
Arsene Wenger back in 1996 because A, I think he was only the second or third foreign coach in the Premier League in England. There was no real history of foreign coaches. He was coming from a club in Japan, Mm -hmm. you know. So maybe that's something Arsenal need to rediscover when they eventually make whatever decision they're going to make about a a new coach, Uh, you know, without having that discussion about should it happen, shouldn't it happen. Maybe there is something to be said for for trying something that isn't what everybody kind of expects. I think that's exactly right. And I think that's what something that's something that not a lot of Premier League clubs do. Because like when we're talking about VAR, it's just it's an absurd league, really, the Premier League. Mm. And there's so much at stake financially compared to a lot of other leagues that not a lot of clubs are willing to take a chance on, say, for example, yeah. you know, a guy like um well, I mean, you'd look at Ralph Hasenhuttle. He started off in the in in Austria, and then he was in like the third league in Germany, and basically kept getting promoted and promoted and promoted. And someone like you know Jurgen Klopp started at Mainz, got Mainz promoted, and then got the Dortmund job. And Thomas Tuchel went from Mainz to Dortmund as well. Yeah, uh, Domenico Tedesco, who was the Schalke manager before um, David Wagner, he actually. I don't think was even working in football and, and stepped into football at about 30 years old, um, took a lower league club into the second division and then got the Schalke job. So there is a real trend of promoting upwards mm. in the Bundesliga. I mean, sometimes it doesn't always go right. We actually mentioned it on the podcast this week. There was a couple of years ago bef- uh, before Lucien Favre took over at Dortmund, Peter Stöger lost his job at Cologne because they were bottom of the league and then a week later got the Dortmund job. <laughs> so it doesn't always go right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I think maybe it's something to do with the psychology of each league. You know, I think that in the last decade or so, it's basically Bayern's league in Germany. Mm. So that does remove a certain level of pressure for a lot of clubs because they don't... They don't yeah, really there's no expectation. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that looks like it's kind of changing this, this year and one guy who's getting a lot of praise and rightly so is Marco Rosa who's the Munchen Gladbach uh, coach he they're top of the league still at the moment right. and playing really well he's a really good coach very highly regarded here and someone actually asked us on the podcast you know when will he take a big club job and we, we I mean a little bit flippantly said you know he's already got one because they're a big club Munchen Gladbach mm. here and you know a, a, a big history of playing good football and you know title winners and a lot of really good players have come through that club. Granit Xhaka being one of them, um, you know. So, um, but yeah, I mean, someone like Julian Nagelsmann is a is someone that I think Arsenal should definitely be keeping an eye on because he's still only thirty three, I think. Yeah, and which is bizarre considering he's been around for ages. It feels like, but he's got Leipzig playing some really good stuff this year, and there's definitely a change from last season under Ralph Rangnick. Yeah. Um I'm just looking at that and, Rosa guy. He's uh he's only 43. Yeah. Um but I mean you look at the the experience that he has as a manager started in 2012, so he would have been what 35? Yeah. Something like that when he got his first job at Lokomotiv Leipzig, then Red Bull Salzburg, and now Borussia Mönchengladbach. And when you Google his name, <laughs> there's two videos come up. Well, there's a number of videos. One is an interview, but uh, one is Mar- Marco Rosa, um, Manchester United target. And the other one, Marco <laughs> Rosa to Arsenal. Managerial tactical go. breakdown. So, you know, you people go. are people are ahead of the game. Look, let's move on from this very quickly and just um, talk uh, a little bit about an upcoming episode that you've got on your podcast, which is, you mentioned it earlier, with, with Ian Wright and it's uh, about the art of finishing. We do have a little clip here, so I'm just going to play the clip. Um, and this is him talking about basically mouthing off at the opposition. It's good. Hang on. I'll play this in now. So you're this interesting mix of um, very animated, but you're this brutally cold-blooded finisher. I see basketball players, like Michael Jordan did that, right? Mm. He was the, he talked so much, but then when it came to shoot, he was brutal. And I'm like, how much did you talk? What did you say to defenders? Like, are you constantly talking? In the way? I, I don't know. I'd, I'd say to them, listen, you was... Even if it wasn't true, I'd say to him, you the focal point of like our boss's talk. He said, you're the one I should play on. You're the one who's going to give me something. 
and you know you say that to him and if, even if he even if it didn't happen you could say he, he's thinking oh shit man they're talking about me and the, team, <laughs> and the same with the goalkeeper so the goalkeeper said you, 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 you pat a lot down I go, we, we've seen it the goalkeeper coach told me watch him doesn't grab anything follow him in all the time and you know what I mean and so you say that to them just to just to make them think about it, even if they're thinking, talking bollocks. He goes in there. Goes in there, so they know. And I say, yeah, if you drop it, next thing you're going to hear is the crowd. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, I mean, what was your experience of of interviewing Ian Wright? I mean, I say that as somebody, you know, who could sit there for hours and just talk to him for hours and hours and hours, listening to him, you know, um, go on about Arsenal and, and just talk football. You know, the enthusiasm that he still has for the club and for the game is amazing. Yeah, I mean, greatest day of my life, basically, in short. <laughs> um, it was really weird because we interviewed him in one of the, in the Adidas box before the Victoria home game. And he came in and, uh, you know, he spoke to Moose before. So, he, you know, he's like, yes, Moose. Straight away, it's Moose. And gives him a big hug. And he's like, yes, Rye. And I was just like, holy shit, this is Ian Wright. And, <laughs> And, you know, it was just great. We just sat there, chatted for an hour and really got into the kind of nitty gritty of finishing. And he was talking about all kinds of stuff, like really famous Arsenal goals, but really going into it about how, mm. you know, like the one against Leeds where it was, I wasn't at the anniversary recently. I think he posted it on his Instagram and actually mentioned it that it was, I think I commented saying it was a terrible ball from Burkamp because it was the one where Burkamp kind of flicks it straight in his face. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, he then kind of breaks down where he knows that where John Lukic is. Yeah. And oh, this is the about, chip. Yeah. Yeah. And talking about where the defender is and that he's not going to, he doesn't do this. And I think that Moose and I have had a number of conversations about Ian Wright before. And, you know, I think if he was playing today, he'd be at Barcelona. I really think he's that good. He was that good. I think that his skill set in today's game is completely transferable. And, he was such a lethal striker. I think that maybe because he's um, of his personality on TV, I don't think people of a certain generation really, this isn't to kind of slag them off or anything at all. It's just that I'm, you know, we're, well, we're older, mm. um, but he was lethal with any kind of finish, long range, short range, left foot, right foot chips. And yeah, chips, mm. all kinds of volleys, just and I just don't. I think he'd be he'd easily be a hundred million plus striker nowadays. Um, and he really was that good. And it was just really great. I mean, I was sat in between the two of them, so I was kind of like just a you know like a having the best birthday present ever kind of thing. Just sat there <laughs> listening to him talk about stuff, and he was talking about how he a lot of his finishing went back to the days of playing Sunday League and how he would play games, not giving too much away, but how he would sometimes play games and just say, I'm just going to kick with my left foot all game. And that would mean it was automatic. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And we, we we just, it was just really good getting him talking properly about the, the almost like the science behind it. Because, that's it, yeah. That's, that's um, what, what's interesting about stuff like that is, you know, you hear players reminisce and talk about the good old days and what have you, but the actual nitty gritty of of how they do what they do um, because, you know, we, we all play football and we all like to think we know a thing or two about football, but, you know, these guys, to get where they are and to do what they've done, you know, have got something a little bit extra, whether it's, you know, pure talent or whether it's mentality or whether it's practice or, you know, yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, uh, I think the thing is that I often think that, you know, because I still play football in, um, you know, Berlin Kreisliga and Musa played until very recently as well, and... I mean, obviously it's a completely different level, but you know, it, it's not terrible. And mm. um, I just think that when you, I think a lot of fans are so used to almost that kind of FIFA culture where you can make any player be amazing every game, no matter what the circumstances are. And I think sometimes we should probably cut players a little bit of slack because mm. th the thing that you you don't realize or sometimes it's really easy to forget and even you know i i do it sometimes is that every little every little thing that they're making look so easy on the football pitch is you know a million micro calculations in a 
tiny, tiny split second that is made to look that easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I actually think that was one of Mesut Ozil's biggest problems is that he often makes a lot of stuff look too easy. And I don't think people maybe appreciate how mm. how good he is and how much of an impact he has on players around him. And using a, my dad as a prime example, my dad was actually a really good footballer. He was at Arsenal through the youth team and played at a really decent amateur standard. And midway through, well, through Ozil's first season, around Christmas time, he was like, oh, this guy, is he really all that? And we went to see the Everton FA Cup game. And that was the first time my dad had seen him live. And he just turned to me and he was just like, holy shit this guy <laughs> you know and because so much of the stuff that he was doing you don't even see on a camera because it's so far away from the ball yeah 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 and, and i think that this is what was really interesting about speaking to ian Wright because he doesn't often um put that side of him forward you know he's a happy-go-lucky very kind of like jokey you know upbeat kind of guy but when he gets into the like the science of it and it, you're just like I mean, I was, I could have sat there for hours. The only reason we stopped was because they brought us pie and mash. So we had to eat it before it got cold. I think. Well, yeah, look, priorities. I understand. Exactly. I understand you know. how it goes. Okay. Well, look, <laughs> I look forward to listening to that episode uh, of the podcast. And uh, thank you very much indeed for being uh, here with me today on this sort of long, rambly, interlull, um, vaguely football related chat. Ryan, thanks a million. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed to Ryan. You can find him on Twitter at Ryan Hon. That's at Ryan Hon with two N's. And also the uh, co-host of the Stadio podcast, which is on Twitter at Stadio, at Stadio. And along with Musa, you can uh, check that out. Get it wherever you get podcasts, which, of course, as we know, is in the, uh, the podcast district. You know, you've got a few places there. Podcast Hut. That's uh, that's on third, I think. Also, Podcasts Are Us. That's also on third. Our Old Pleasure. That's another one. I think that's that's on third as well. In fact, they're all there in the podcast complex. It's on third. So check it out if you're, you know, looking for a podcast. If you are looking for something extra to listen to over the weekend or over the interlull and you're not already an Arsblog member on Patreon, you can sign up right now, patreon.com forward slash Arsblog. Myself and Andrew Allen did a YouTube live stream on Wednesday night, which is also available as a podcast, which is kind of like an Arsblog history thing, how the site started, how it developed, how it grew, the various ups and downs along the way. So that's the latest one, but you get instant access to all the podcasts there. You get ad-free podcasts every Every week, you get ad-free Arse Blog apps. There's articles. There are history podcasts. There's some specials in there, too. We've got some more specials to come. So if you fancy signing up, getting all that stuff, and supporting everything we do here on the site, you can do it at patreon.com forward slash arseblog for just five euros per month. James and I will be here on Monday. We'll have an Arsecast Extra talking about more of the nothing that's happened between now and then. Although, who knows? Maybe something will happen. If it does, we'll talk about it. If it doesn't, we'll probably probably just talk about stuff like who knows maybe some magpies again would you punch a kangaroo in the face or if i paid you 40 euros would you eat the insole of a running shoe of someone who's just completed a marathon in 120 degree heat so it's probably a bit you know slippy with sweat and maybe blister juice and stuff like i said we can only work with what we've got to work with hope you enjoyed the show thanks for being here as ever catch you on the next one until then cheers bye bye What happens when a South Korean man is taken unexpectedly to London? He's told he can fulfill his dreams, but those dreams become a nightmare. Who was responsible? Where did the money go? And what happened to that man? My name is Drexel Falcon, and in this new podcast series from Goblet Media, we ask, what the fuck happened? 
with Chu Young Park. Available now wherever you get podcasts. It's down on third, the podcast district.